so welcome to this afternoon session. Uh, so we start with the first of three lectures by Fabio Franchini. And Fabio will uh, give you lectures on the blackboard as it looks on everything you ever wanted to know about BD Ansatz. Absolutely not. <laughs> Just a mild, very small introduction to the field. So as I said, this is a small, in, um, small introduction. Uh, as you can already see, I have a bad handwriting. I apologize, but I was not taught properly and I'm too old to improve much. Uh, so if you don't understand what I'm writing, please ask. But the good news is that everything I uh, write is in uh, this book, uh, which you can also find on the archive at this uh, address. Don't bother buying the book, I'm not getting any money, but if you like to have the paper feeling, that's a separate thing. So in this set of notes, I actually cover the uh, four models, which is a very small set of uh, what is integrability. And the question is also, what is integrability in general? And I think that uh, Fabian and uh, Joel had a much better uh, explanation and I can uh, give you because I think that the difference between integrable and non-integrable model is most evident when you take them out of equilibrium and you do something uh, a priori. But, but one thing that you should have noticed by now is that all integrable models are one-dimensional uh, systems. So there is a very simple uh, reason for that and it is that uh, you have been really told that the core of integrability is the fact that multi-body uh, scattering processes can be factorized in a series of two-body processes and when you are in uh, one dimension when you have one particle with momentum p1 and one with momentum p2 entering scattering and then you have the outgoing uh, state and you impose of course conservation of momentum and conservation of energy, this only leaves you with the possibility that at most uh, P1 has gone into uh, P2 prime, but uh, the momenta are uh, conserved because of kinematical constraint. So this kinematical constraint greatly simplifies the job of eventually proving integrability in terms of the factorization of scattering process and if you are in higher dimension already the fact that you have to take into account more kinematical uh, variables make uh, non-trivial integrability hopeless. There is some sense in which there are higher dimensional systems which are integrable but in a sense they're all, always foliating somehow in a two-dimensional systems, uh, two-dimensional uh, manifold. Uh, among uh, these uh, models, uh, there are of course their peculiarities. The XY model, as uh, you have been told, it's free fermion and is better solved in the free fermionic approach than, uh, than rather through uh, Pete Ansatz. Lieb Liniger is probably the most, uh, the simplest uh, system to visualize the basic idea behind Pete Ansatz. Uh, but instead, uh, this today and tomorrow I will uh, focus on the Heisenberg chain, which was the model originally solved by Bete, and I can reconvene tomorrow because Fabian already said everything that I wanted to cover today and uh, more. But okay, maybe I'll give some more uh, details. Uh, the, from the richness point of view, I think that the XXZ uh, chain is the one that best conveys the subtleties and the power and the complication of Bete Ansatz. And I will use it because I would like tomorrow in the second lecture to give a glimpse of what is the algebraic approach. So here there are essentially four types of Bete Ansatz uh, that you can have. The original was the coordinate uh, Bete Ansatz, the one that uh, Bete tried out which has already been seen, it's just an answer on the type of wave functions that might be the eigenstates of a certain Hamiltonian, which turn out to be exact to the surprise of uh, Bete. Uh, I think historically the next one was the thermodynamic Bete ansatz given by the famous Yang-Yang uh, uh, equation for the lieb uh, case of which Fabian gave a glimpse of the idea, but unfortunately I don't think that I have the time 
uh, to, get, to say much more than uh, what he uh, said. The asymptotic beta ansatz instead is what you heard uh, from Alexios, which is uh, the way uh, to solve models with long-range interactions such as Calogero. And then there is the algebraic uh, beta ansatz, which is essentially the second quantization version of the coordinate beta ansatz, because as you have already noticed, the coordinate beta ansatz gives the solution, the again function, as a sum over all the possible permutations, so is an ex Explicit solution on one side, but not very workable on, this, on the other because it is uh, is given in terms of a large number of terms for which the computation are rather complicated. So it's wonderful if you want to want to uh, extract the thermodynamic properties of the system, but if you want to construct observables, it's essentially useless. So in the algebraic version, you move to second quantization, and so you describe your eigenstates in terms of a set of creation operators, uh, creation and annihilation, apply to uh, reference uh, state, which gives the form of the um, state in a much more compact uh, form. Unfortunately, there is conservation of evil, because at that point, uh, all, all your local observables that you're interested in are uh, expressed in a very uh, complicated form in terms of uh, the, uh, this um, creation and relation uh, operator, so you pushed the evil on another side, but you might be clever enough uh, to be able to resum it, and in some case, you can get uh, beautiful results. So, let's get cracking. So, this is essentially a technical talk, and, but what I would like to do is uh, to do the to work out the solution of the Eisenberg uh, chain to extract some uh, interesting uh, physical property, and in particular, okay, let me introduce uh, the problem. So this is a one-dimensional uh, chain with uh, spin one half. It is uh, SU2 uh, invariant because it's defined as the product between the uh, nearest uh, spins, uh, but in light of integrability, I want to consider an additional magnetic field that I can uh, put in the z direction, for instance. And so this breaks the SU2 symmetry into a U1 symmetry. Which is all that I need uh, to solve the model. And this has an important uh, consequence because it means that uh, the uh, Hamiltonian commutes with a total magnetization along the z direction. And which means that I can classify the eigenstate in terms of their magnetization. So I can start with a state with maximal uh, magnetization, the one that has n over 2 magnetization, and this is only one. And this, I will denote it as zero. I will call it pseudo-vacuum for reasons that will become clearer when I'll introduce uh, the algebraic approach, and which is the ferromagnetic state. So this is the only state that has this magnetization, so it has to be an eigenstate of your system. Then I can move on and say, what is the next magnetization that I can have? I flip one uh, spin. So what will uh, be um, my space uh, spanned by? Well, I just flip one spin at a time, and so this is just the, my, the, uh, the annihilation operator, the reduction operator applied to the pseudo -va to the vacuum at a point n. Can this be an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian without doing any calculation? Of course not, because the Hamiltonian is translational invariant. This uh, state is not, but it's a good guess then to construct states that are linear superposition of uh, this sort of states. <clears throat> And then you can uh, try it out uh, this combination, and this is indeed an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. 
with, and if you put periodic boundary condition, which we would definitely do for technical uh, convenience, you also get that these states are eigenstates if you satisfy essentially the free uh, quantization condition. So here something has already happened uh, that um, is interesting to me. Uh, the fact that I moved naturally from a state of magnetization n over 2 to one with one lesser uh, magnetization. So which means that from here to here I create a one, uh, a spin one excitation. So that this state is a delta s equal to one and this is called a magnum. I started from a system with spin one half and therefore I wonder if I can excite also spin one half excitation, but how could I do that? It seems that the only thing that I can do is uh, flip a spin. So do you know if in nature there are spin one half excitations? Hmm? Okay. <laughs> in such a setting? You should. You should because I suppose that you're familiar with nail, uh, the nail state and you're familiar with the concept of domain wall in a nail state. And you should know that if I go from this state to this, what I did is that I flip every other spin after a certain uh, point. And so I uh, flip this one, so I flip it down into up. So this is, so I start, so in here I increase my magnetization by one, here I decrease it by one, and then I continue going on. So this is a sum of uh, minus one uh, to the n and going from zero to infinity. And last week we had a lecture by uh, Musardo told us about the uh, zeta function. So you know that uh, that can be used uh, to calculate this sum. And the result is one half. So this is a naive uh, proof that the domain wall uh, excitation carries spins one half and therefore it can be interpreted as a spin. But you see that this is a very non-trivial uh, state with uh, which extends over the whole uh, system. So it's not really Oh yes, I did indeed I did. Okay, then I have to do it again. Yeah, thank you. Indeed, but that is too similar to what I would like to do later, so I wanted to give it a different, but yes, indeed that's correct. <laughs> So this is to say that indeed you can uh, create a spin one half uh, excitation, which is a spin on, but this is not a simple excitation in terms of the spin. So what I would really like uh, to do in this set of lectures is to show how uh, the spin on excitation naturally emerges in a non-trivial way from uh, the beta answer solution, because uh, to me it's a very beautiful uh, proof of how you get these uh, collective excitations, which are the core of uh, then trying to uh, uh, provide a, uh, a scaling description of these models. So let me go on now that I announced what is my goal. So again, I said that this is an eigenstate of the uh, Hamiltonian. So the natural question is, what is 
the energy of this state. I also should have done this here because it is a reference energy and I think it is like this. Let me check. Oh, you can do the calculation by hand. Okay. Yeah. It's While for the magnon, you have the vacuum energy plus J1 minus cosine K. Of course, here uh, I will have to add uh, the um, lattice spacing to make this a dimensionless quantity. So you see that this is um, the, an excitation that in the scaling limit gives a quadratic uh, dispersion. Uh, relation, so this is a Galilean uh, excitation. So let's press on, let's go to the next state. This one will be the last one that I do explicitly, I'm not going to do all of them, of course. So here, again, I can uh, construct uh, states by lowering another, um, another uh, spin. So this I can write by n1, n2, yes, n1, n2. Of course, I cannot apply these at the same place. So this I have n uh, times n minus one half uh, states, half because uh, the order does not matter. And I can try to construct them as a sum of plane waves, but now you see that this uh, trick will not work. These states will not immediately be eigenstate of my model because, as uh, Fabian essentially already mentioned, uh, this is only true when they are sufficiently far apart. So my answer wave function is to take a suitable superposition with some amplitude of these states. Then plug this in the Hamiltonian and find if I can uh, find F such that it satisfies the eigenvalue uh, equation. Um, and moreover, to simplify the story, I take the, this function to have the simplest form, which is a sum of plane waves. Okay, and with two momenta, k1 and 1, k2 and 2, plus a prime e to the i, k2 and 1, plus k1 and 2. So this, again, is a standard problem of um, first semester in uh, quantum mechanics. You can always place yourself in the center of mass reference, so this is a simple body problem. You, uh, you do the algebra, and you find that, indeed, this is a, a state, an eigenstate with energy E0 plus J sum J1, 2, 1, minus cosine kj if the ratio between the two amplitude is e to the i k1 plus k2 plus 1 minus 2 e to the minus i no, e to the i k1 e to the i k1 plus k2 plus 1 minus 2 e to the i k2. You can easily convince yourself that this quantity for real k has a unit modulus. So it is natural to write this as a phase. I'll just write that without. And so you see that if you, you choose your k1 and k2 in such a way, oh, no, sorry, 
that if you choose your amplitude in such a way that they satisfy this uh, condition, this is an eigenstate, and the energy is just given by the sum of two magnets. So uh, it seems that you, this is just a simple superposition of, uh, of two magnets. What you still have uh, to do is to determine uh, what are the case by imposing periodic boundary conditions and uh, checking the monodromy of the wave function. So, um, essentially what you need uh, is um, that you have that e to the i k1 n is equal to e to the i theta and e to the i k2 n is e to the minus i theta. Which means that n k1 is equal to theta plus 2 i i1 and n k2 is equal to minus theta plus 2 i i2 with i1 and i2 arbitrary a priori arbitrary uh, quantum numbers integer numbers And so you have to remember that this theta is a function of k1 and uh, k2, and so you have to solve this typically numerically to find the allowed uh, states. So you see that this is similar to the free case because k1 and k2 are 2 pi over n times an integer, but you have a modification of the allowed integer compared to the free case because of this uh, scattering phase. So how do you choose uh, these uh, quantum numbers? Well, clearly they have to be between 0 and uh, minus 1 to be within a Brillouin uh, zone. Uh, so, and clearly exchanging the two should not matter because K1 and K2 are equivalent. So you have the choice between n and n plus 1 over two uh, quantum numbers. And immediately you see that something is wrong because instead your space is given by uh, uh, my n less uh, eigenvalues. And in fact, when you solve this uh, equation, you see that the solution is not so simple, that the majority of solutions that you have are real, but that you have also some uh, complex solution. And in some cases, this equation does not have any uh, solution that you can find numerically. So also from the numerical point of view, this is a, becomes in that respect a complicated uh, problem because as long as you have to look for two solutions on the real line, you have very good uh, numerical methods. Already when you have to look for them in the complex plane, instead things get uh, complicated. And moreover, if you don't know if you have a solution at all, then this becomes not an efficient uh, way to do it. So, one uh, way to solve it, for instance, is well, that empirically you find that whenever i1 minus i2 is greater than 1, uh, this is typically a real uh, solution. So you only have to worry about when n1 and n2 are uh, close uh, to one another. And uh, moreover, you realize that you have a simple wave function and therefore if you're looking for a complex solution of the time of the type some real part plus an imaginary part, the other have to be complex conjugated in order to make sure that your your wave function does not uh, diverge when the uh, flipped spins are uh, too far apart. And then you can plug this equation here and uh, solve it. And at that point, this decouples into a two real equation for which you can find numerical solution. So here, a couple of comments are uh, in order because on one side, I'm treating this K1 and K2 as if they were uh, momenta, like for free uh, particles, 
Uh, on the other side, this is really an interacting system, and therefore these two magnons have no meaning uh, out independently. So you have to remember that all these quasi-momenta that I'm writing here are most of all a bookkeeping method to write my medibody uh, wave function. And therefore you might wonder if there is any physics, I mean, if I really have to worry about having a complex of uh, real solution. I mean, does do I have anything different? But uh, the correct uh, comment was made by Alexios uh, this morning about the fact that if you have some imaginary part, that means that the relative uh, weight between the two uh, parts of uh, the wave function has some uh, real um, exponential decay, which corresponds to having a bound state. So when you solve, so the only observable in this uh, system is the total uh, momentum k1 plus k2 which is equal to uh, to k so how do you know if uh, you have two real solutions which amount to total momentum k or whether you have uh, two complex solutions which amount to momentum k well again to find uh, no, actually, I, I have, yes. So when you have this uh, such uh, solution, you find that the energy is plus 2j1 minus cos of k half cos of little k. And moreover, you can uh, prove that in the thermodynamic limit, this goes to E0 plus J over 2, 1 minus cos K, because there are some simplifications, so you can relate uh, analytically small k uh, to, to capital K. So then you can go to your experimentalist friend who has, was able to realize the XXX uh, chain, ask them to do a neutron scattering experiment and tell you what uh, kind of spectrum, what kind of dispersion of relation do you have. And if somehow you know that your system is um, made out of just two uh, flipped uh, spin, you will see that in uh, one case, which is this one, you have that you can choose these two real k1 and k2 which, which sum to total momentum k. So this will be a continuum uh, which uh, start here and then open up. Now how was the, the curve? While in this case you have just one line of dispersion relation. So despite the fact that, the, that the, these two quasi momentum are bookkeeping way, they really distinguish the two type of uh, quasi-particles that you can have in the system, either two real magnon or two bound uh, magnon, which from all practical purpose uh, behave like uh, its own particle, its own uh, quantity for which you can forget about internal structure. So these are the two main ingredients to then go on to the sector of generic magnetization. Perhaps uh, one one could uh, maybe I can make a comment. I mean, so I think you you already said it, but it's probably worthwhile stressing it um, that it's a bound state in the sense that this two particle wave function decays exponentially with respect to the relative coordinate between the two particles. So they basically fly around. Yeah. And blow. And I just want. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Yes. Of course. In the way that I wrote the wave function, I immediately assumed that they were ordered, and then, then if you switch the order, you have to switch. Uh, yes, yes, you have to uh, you have to switch the momenta accordingly. Yep. So these are the main ingredients. 
uh, to do the case with generic magnetization in which I flipped our uh, spins is just a matter of keeping all the factors around. It's only some algebra. There is no much uh, complication. So you, again, you write your wave function as a sum over the position of all flipped spins. with some amplitude. And again, here I assume that they are uh, order for uh, simplicity. And then I further make the assumption that I can write this amplitude as a sum over plane weights. K P J minus K P L. So here I wrote a bit more compactly uh, gen the generalization of the previous wave function. So you remember before I had uh, two terms in which in one I had K1 and 1, K2 and 2. The other I had uh, K2 and 1 and K1 and 2. So for generic number of uh, particles, I write that as a sum over all the possible uh, permutations, so all the way that I can permute 1, 2, 3, up to R in all its possible ways, with this uh, phase factor, which is a sum of plane waves in which each coordinate n is, is paired with each uh, quasi-momentum uh, that is given. And instead of writing the amplitude ahead of time, since I already assume that the ratio between two amplitudes is a phase, I write that as a generic uh, phase for which every time I interchange this was supposed to be comma, uh, such that this function is odd under the exchange of um, the two momenta, so that exchanging two momenta, I get this, uh, this phase out. And, and again, I do the machinery, I apply this uh, wave function uh, to the Hamiltonian, I found that indeed it is the sum, it, it is an eigenstate with the energy given by the bare energy of the magnon excitation if I have a similar relation to the one before, which is e to the i theta kj k L being equal to minus e to the i kj plus kl plus 1 minus 2 e to the i kj divided by e to the i kj plus kl plus 1 minus 2 e to the i kl. Then, as before, I need to quantize, uh, to find the quantization rules for this quasi-momenta. So I put the system with periodic boundary condition, and I find the consistency relation. So there are two ways to look at this. The most physical one is the idea that you have your system with periodic boundary conditions, with your flipped spin at your coordinate, and one, and two, so on and so forth. So you take one, and you take it around for a spin and bring it back uh, to the original place. Uh, the wave function should go into itself because the system is translational uh, invariant. And along uh, the way, this wave function had momentum kj, which gives a dynamical uh, phase equal to e to the i kj, n just by uh, the dynamical phase but it also scatter with all the other particles in the middle, and so you have to account for the additional scattering phase of kj with all the other 
particles and the two factors have to, uh, to contribute to an integer uh, phase. This is uh, a good way of thinking, but uh, some people are not very comfortable because it smells a bit semi-classical because at one point, at one, from one side, you assign uh, each particle a definite momentum, but at the same time, you also assume that they are placed somewhere where they can uh, scatter with the other. And so it, you, it, it, might, it, it gives a weary feeling about the fact that you are fixing both position and a momentum. The, there is a more strict mathematical way uh, to think of it, and to think that in reality, there is no reason to, uh, to impose uh, this ordering uh, to begin with, that by exchanging each uh, position coordinate, the wave function should remain uh, the same, so that in particular that this uh, amplitude here has a bosonic uh, nature about it. And then you realize that exchanging to uh, position can be, uh, is the same as exchanging to uh, momenta in this uh, permutation so that you have a two kind of permutation available. One is the permutation of the coordinates, which is called the simplex, in which you order uh, the, the particle, and one is instead uh, the permutation of the way that you assign uh, the momentum. And so the position in periodic boundary condition is requiring consistency between the total symmetricity of your wave function and the symmetricity that you have uh, in this uh, permutation. And so that you want to keep permuting particles around and see that this is the same that you would have by uh, permuting uh, momentum. But mathematically, you always get this. So you can think it in either way, and you get uh, this beta equation, which upon taking the logarithm give you the quantization rule. And these are called the beta equation. Which you can solve uh, numerically. And once you have, you have your uh, n quasi momenta, you plug them here, and essentially you are done. You have solved your system. So the benefit, if you want, of beta answer at this uh, point is that it gives you a way to find in polynomial time your eigenstate, uh, the eigenstate to your uh, wave function. Because typically you can solve this uh, set of coupled equations in a uh, polynomial way, while if you had to solve the original Hamiltonian Schrodinger uh, problem, then you would have uh, to solve an exponential uh, problem, and therefore, a priori, this gives you this uh, simplification. Of course, the drawback is that this procedure gives you one eigenstate at a time, uh, and so the total complexity is preserved, but typically you're interested in few eigenstates, the ground state and the few excited states. So this gives you uh, this kind of improvement. Unfortunately, right now we know that uh, solving the one-dimensional uh, many-body problem is not really an exponential problem because uh, you can find better algorithm, and therefore, from this point of view, but the answer does not really give you a big uh, improvement in uh, um, in efficiency. Moreover, you have that when you solve this equation, you still have the problem from before that you'll have that some choice of quantum numbers will not produce any uh, solution, and some will give instead a complex solution. So even from the computational point of view, it's not obvious that you can just put it in your Mathematica and have Mathematica run while you get a coffee. You still have to think a little bit on how to do it. So there are uh, ways uh, to fix it. So the first thing that you that is not very convenient in this equation is the fact that the scattering phase is not um, a difference equation. And we heard uh, in the uh, talk before lunch how important it is uh, to have a difference equation. So you want to make a change of coordinate, as Fabian already uh, mentioned. So you want to introduce uh, some quantity, which we call rapidities. Uh, 
lambda j through this uh, parameterization that uh, turn your uh, beta equation into a difference equation so that um, So that I introduce this function theta n lambda, which is two arc tangent of lambda over n, and my beta, and I have that theta kj minus uh, kj comma kl is equal to minus theta two lambda j minus lambda l plus Pi signum of the real part of lambda j minus lambda l. And then I invert this equation to put it here. And so finally, I have that my beta equation are n theta 1 lambda j equal to 2 pi ij plus sum from j equal to 1 to R of theta 2 lambda j minus lambda L. Sorry? So the theta kj comma kl, uh, this one, uh, theta n of lambda is equal to 2 arc tangent of lambda over n. So an important feature of uh, this equation is that you can immediately recognize that if you choose two quantum numbers to be equal, then this implies that also the two corresponding uh, rapidities are the same, which is not the case in this, uh, in this form. And then if you plug uh, this, uh, the condition that you have two equal numbers into your wave function, you see that your wave function vanishes. Because somehow, uh, even though uh, I have a, a bosonic nature to this amplitude, it has a fermionic nature with respect to the change of uh, quasi-momenta, so the two quasi-momenta make it vanish. And this is a typic uh, typical feature of uh, beta ansatz Uh, formula four? Uh, yeah, you just have to calculate uh, how many states you have, which typically. Uh, uh, I mean, there is, I'm not sure if there is a. I mean, I, I don't know by heart uh, what is the behavior for large R, but yeah, definitely exponential. But, uh, just yeah, the product of all the ways that you can assign. So, so this means that uh, choosing the same quantum numbers uh, in the beta equation uh, produces a degenerate solution, so you should not consider uh, such case. So this is not allowed, which in turn means that you can uh, choose the... Um, quantum numbers in a strictly uh, ordered uh, fashion without loss of generality. This is uh, the first simplification. And so this also tells you that you can characterize uniquely each state in terms of the quantum numbers. And these quantum numbers have this uh, fermionic nature so that you have uh, your uh, space of quantum number, which are integers. Uh, you pick the integers that you want for your state. 
then you process this in terms of the beta equation. And this turn each of this quantum number into a quasi, uh, actually, let me write it, in, 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 into a rapidity. Unfortunately, it is not exactly like this because, as we know, you can have complex solution. So to, solve, to, character, to find the generic solution in the complex plane of this equation is a hard uh, problem, and it is one of the peculiar things of bete the fact that oh, a keen eye, the bete is very elegant, and yet we have no idea of whether uh, in their solu the solution of a generic beta uh, system have a simple structure or not. And the answer is that most likely not. So at this point, you have to make this string hypothesis assumption that Fabia mentioned uh, today, which is the hypothesis that if you have a lambda j which has um, a complex uh, amplitude, then this belongs to a set of uh, rapidities with the same real part and with a well-defined structure in the complex plane. Yes. So if you, once you write in it as a difference equation, at least you are sure that whatever choice of integer uh, or quantum numbers that you take, this equation will have a solution, which was not the case in this form. So at least once you have this one, you can get stubborn and uh, find it, because you know that it exists. While here, instead, you don't know. So don't know if uh, you find a solution. So here there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the choice of beta numbers and uh, the eigenstate of your system. But nonetheless, so at, this, at this point, you can have your code uh, cracking and finding all the, uh, all the solution. Um, yeah, so what do I say? Um, so as already, Fabian already uh, mentioned, having um, an imaginary component to one of the uh, rapidities means uh, that the left-hand side of the beta equations uh, either explodes or uh, goes uh, to zero, and therefore the easiest answer for what will happen to the right-hand side is that uh, these will also have the same behavior by having either a singularity or a pole. This is definitely true if you consider uh, a number of uh, complex solutions which is small compared to the total number of uh, magnons that you excite, but once you start having uh, larger uh, complex uh, solution, then you can have magic uh, cancellation because, especially if you think of a finite system, this quantity will not be strictly infinite, it will be very large, but you have uh, a number of factors which scales like n on the left-hand side, and therefore the, you have magic cancellation in which these large numbers might compensate one another, and indeed uh, the literature reports of such uh, unusual or strange uh, solutions where the string hypothesis is not satisfied. Nonetheless, uh, from the, for many practical uh, purposes, we know that these states are rare, uh, so compared to the exponential number of states uh, that you have, uh, these are rare. So for thermodynamic properties, uh, these states can be uh, ignored. And this was uh, the result of the great work by Takahashi, who, by employing uh, the string hypothesis, managed to calculate the thermodynamic uh, quantities, which matched uh, very well uh, the numerical uh, calculations. However, nowadays we are interested in out of equilibrium uh, settings, and even more, we are interested in uh, trying to calculate also observables related to some uh, local quantity. And if so might happen, 
that some of Serbol that, that you are interested in has a large overlap uh, with one of these uh, runaway states. So this is a typical case of uh, a large fluctuation uh, instance. And so in this case, these states might be important, might contribute with an order of one uh, amplitude uh, to your uh, expectation values, and therefore they become important and not having a clear classification and not as far as I understand, not even having an idea of whether there is such a classification or they're really weirdly uh, random, uh, this is uh, something I think makes the community uh, uncomfortable. And it's a problem that uh, people have to deal with. But okay, let me go back to the string hypothesis. So I assume uh, that if I have uh, such a uh, solution, then it belongs to a family of um, complex solution characterized with the same real part of uh, the same real part and equispaced um, let me see in my unit yeah so this is y minus equispaced amplitude in the real uh, in a complex plane so that they belong to this string modulo some uh, deviation which uh, I will not uh, consider. So you have that odd uh, string solution with odd numbers will have uh, the central one line on the real axis while for even number uh, you'll have uh, this structure and then you can start counting states like that. So as I said, as, I, as we find out in the uh, two Magnon solution uh, from before, when you have this uh, structure, you can consider this as a quantity of its own. So this represents a set of three Magnons, which are moving together with the same uh, momentum, which is given by the center of mass uh, one, uh, but with very limited uh, freedom so that when they move uh, too far apart, the amplitude of the wave function vanish. Uh, and this amplitude is typically of uh, uh, one um, lattice uh, spacing. And therefore, we can consider each complex solution like a new particle, heavy in a sense, given by these uh, three states. So these are three magnon. Uh, solution. So instead of keeping around uh, both the real part and the imaginary part, we group each component of a magnum by its real part and we give it an additional quantum number to identify how many magnums it contains. So a uh, solution which is purely uh, real has only one magnum. This will be a two magnum solution, then a three magnum solution so that I'll further modify my equations so that I identify the uh, Just a second, I got lost in my own notation. So I will have um, a magnon of type M, which belongs to a complex with lambda capital M uh, real part plus the, um, the imaginary component where small m runs from minus M to M. And I classify the magnons as 0, 1 half, 1, 3 half, so on and so forth, uh, to use this SU2 uh, rotation so that this is a singlet containing only one magnon. Uh, this is in the spin 1 half representation, so it contains two magnons, three magnons, uh, five magnons, so on and so forth. I have to remember that the total magnetization, the total number of magnons, is, has to be conserved. So this is a sum over 2m plus 
one, which is the number of magnons in, in representation times the number mu n, which is the number of magnon m bound states. And then you can convince yourself, it's an algebra that I as an exercise, that uh, you, in the beta equation, you can first factor out the scattering between magnons uh, be, uh, belonging to one uh, complex, and you have a lot of simplification, so that these magnons uh, acquire a modified momentum and a modified um, energy contribution, so that in particular, the momentum of a magnon of type m with central, pass, uh, central mass lambda m is given by pi minus theta 2m plus 1 lambda m, and the energy is given by j 2m plus 1, 1 minus cos of p m lambda m. So you see that the difference is that as a magnon increases in size, uh, this denominator increases. We already saw that when you had the free magnon, this was one. When we had the two magnon uh, bound state in the previous case, this was equal to two, and so on and so forth. So uh, this particle behaves with a modified dispersion relation which uh, reflects its heaviness. And, and then you can uh, factorize your beta equation uh, in terms of the magnon of the, tip, of the different types. Yeah. So that you have the, the new set of beta equation where I have the jth rapidity for the magnon of type m is equal to 2 pi i m j, which is the, quant the jth quantum number for the magnon of type m plus a scattering phase lambda m j minus lambda m prime j prime where this scattering phase is written as a sum over L from m minus m prime to m plus m prime of theta 2L lambda plus theta 2L plus 2 lambda. So these details at this moment are not uh, very important, but uh, what is important is uh, the structure of the solution. So you can start constructing your solutions by uh, saying I want to have five uh, real magnon, two magnons with uh, two type, uh, two bound state, and then you uh, select your quantum numbers, you solve this equation and you get a state with a quasi-particle content that you, uh, that you specify. However, when you do this, you find that you cannot choose the quantum numbers at arbitrary uh, values. It's a bit complicated to explain why, but you find that the range of these quantum numbers depends on the choices that you made uh, for, um, for the type of quasi-particles that you inputted. So in particular, you uh, find that uh, your quantum number for the type aim belongs to a range between a maximum and a minimum quantum numbers which are uh, symmetric, where this max 
is given by n minus 1 over 2 minus sum over, over all the magnons that you, uh, all the magnon, uh, all the complex types that you have in the system with this factor. Okay, so I'm sorry this was rather technical and probably uh, boring, but this gives me all ingredients that I need to start constructing my uh, Hilbert space in terms of these quasi-particles. So now I can start doing it. So, well... I think before you start doing anything, you should give your audience the opportunity to ask some questions yes, about this calculation. Of course. But I'm afraid that they are all asleep. They, they have been suspiciously quiet. Everything has been utterly clear to everybody. Exactly. So you can take your spin chain and solve it explicitly for a few spins. Exactly, right? Yeah. Uh, and then you can compare with the better answer. What do you see? Do you see completeness of the spectrum? Uh, if you consider these string states, etc., can you answer questions whether this is a complete description by looking at the first few uh, lattice side cases? I don't think that you can answer that question. It looks rather complete, but you have these runaway states, and it's complicated when you have a small chain to understand if this runaway state will go back into a string as you increase the system size. Well, because as Fabian showed, um, so say that I consider just um, a two-string solution, you can have deviation so that if you have a delta deviation on the left, the corresponding one has to have a delta deviation on the right. There is this uh, rule that to ensure... Um, uh, reality and, and, uh, and boundness, uh, you have this structure. And for uh, typically, you expect this deviation delta uh, uh, as disappearing in the, uh, in the trigonometric limit, going like 1 over n. Uh, for this runaway solution, instead, uh, this never, uh, never uh, goes to zero. So if you consider a small chain and you keep increasing uh, the system size, and you see that this delta stubborn and stubbornly remains there, you don't know if you're just not at the, the limit in which this uh, starts uh, converging, or if this instead is a runaway uh, state. So it's hard uh, to answer this question for small system size. Well, I mean, so maybe I can comment. I mean, so for very small systems, uh, people have done it. I wrote a paper on that myself when I was young. So probably before most of the people in the audience were born. Um, uh, so if you do a very small number of sites, like four, six, or something like that, uh, you can. Uh, but that, as Fabio says, uh, most of the solutions you can get very easily, and they fit very nicely into this uh, scheme. But there's a small number of solutions that you have to work hard for. So you can find them. Yeah, but you, you, you basically, because they're not given in, so, in terms of simple uh, string patterns, you really have to uh, search for them uh, solution by solution. So this is not a useful method to do even mesoscopic systems of 20 sides or something like that. And I think that's what the problem is. Yeah, as I, meant, as I mentioned before, I mean, you know that uh, by any choice of the quantum number before you made this string solution, you'll find a solution. And you know that it's somewhere in the complex plane. So there is completeness at that level. I thought that when you ask about completeness is uh, if you, if for small size, you can believe that the string hypothesis seems true or not. That was I, I, I intended. Maybe I misinterpreted your question. So as I said, any other question? So in the thermodynamic limit, is it known that it's true or false, this string hypothesis? 
uh, as, as I said, uh, is it true as long as you're interested only in thermodynamic quantities? If instead you're interested in uh, other uh, questions, like what happens out of equilibrium or... Uh, so, I mean, it's not that it's true. It is acceptable as a conjecture. Uh, while if instead you're looking for certain observables or for the behavior out of equilibrium, then uh, uh, you know that there are a few states which do not comply and, and then you have to worry about it. So, in, so it, I think it is true that it's not complete, that there are some runaway states. So, so, so maybe I can uh, add uh, to, to, to this. Um, so uh, it is believed, uh, and the argument goes back to another organizer of this conference, to Paul Wiegmann. Um, I think it's in Appendix F or something like this of the famous uh, wiegmann Zwelig review. Um, it is believed, so, so uh, a good way to think about it is to think in terms of these macro states I, I discussed this morning, yeah? So where you're in a situation where you have finite densities of uh, one strings, two strings, three strings, four strings, and it's believed, and there are some arguments you can make, they're made by, by Paul and Alexei, uh, that if you consider states where you have a finite density of all of these uh, types of solutions, then the string hypothesis is basically exact. Yeah? And, and you can calculate uh, physical quantities within it, with it and it works. Um, now, if you just take the thermodynamic limit and you ask, uh, for example, what about uh, the ground state and low-lying excited states of uh, the model Fabio is discussing, then uh, you will find there's a problem um, if the magnetic field is equal to zero. So if the magnetic field is not equal to zero, yeah, you're again in a situation where the string hypothesis uh, works beautifully. But the, the, the case of zero magnetic field, you have to define as the limit of h goes to zero. And then you can work with the string hypothesis. Whereas if you stick at h equal to zero, the states Fabio mentioned uh, cause you a lot of grief. Yeah? So, but I recommend looking at this uh, famous review by Paul Wiegmann et al. It's a source of great wisdom. So, um, are there any other questions? You do realize there will be a quiz at the end of this, uh, so uh, it's better you ask anything that is unclear now. To add to, um, to what Fabian was saying, out of this uh, counting rule, you can prove that uh, the number of states that you get with the string hypothesis uh, correctly scale in the proper way. So, which means that the states that do not conform to the string hypothesis are definitely subdominant, which is already comforting. But, but then, depending on the question you ask. So, armed with all these tools, in which, again, as I stress, uh, you can have some ambiguity on what do these um, rapidities represent because there are bookkeeping ways. But nonetheless, uh, there is some truth to the fact that these uh, bounds, these many body states are made by, out of this uh, type of quasi-particles. And I say that because tomorrow I will contradict myself. Uh, so, let me then try to construct the states. So, if this uh, J is uh, positive, Oh, if, if the, yes, if this J is uh, positive so that I'm in the ferromagnetic uh, instance, then the ground state is given by a state with maximum uh, magnetization. So already the ground, the pseudo vacuum is uh, my, uh, my ground state. It's moreover, it's degenerate with uh, all the other uh, states in its multiplet, and you might. Uh, appreciate that if you take lambda zero to be equal to uh, to, uh, to zero or uh, k equal to uh, uh, the, the, the pseudo momentum the, here be equal to zero, uh, the, the difference in energy of this uh, magnon uh, bound state 
uh, is exactly the same as uh, the, the vacuum. So uh, um, a, mag a bound state with zero uh, momentum is part of the same uh, multiplet as uh, the pseudo vacuum. And then on top of that, you can start exciting magnons and uh, bound state of magnons. So you can construct all your Hilbert space starting from any of these uh, ground states and exciting uh, the corresponding uh, magnons. So in this case, uh, the Hilbert space for the low energy states is rather simple and trivial as long as you believe the string hypothesis. If instead you're looking at the antiferromagnetic uh, case, definitely uh, the pseudo vacuum will not be uh, the vacuum. So then you can start wondering how you uh, look uh, for the vacuum. To prove mathematically what I'm going to say is not uh, trivial, it requires a bit more machinery than I can uh, give you, but it is conceivable that the ground state will belong to a state with uh, zero magnetization being an antiferromagnetic uh, state. So you choose R, let me just erase here. I choose j equal to minus one, and so the ground state will belong to the state with zero magnetization. I'm assuming that n is equal to is even, which means that I have n magnons. And, and then I had to look for uh, the ground state among all the possible ways that I can distribute and, and magnons between uh, bound states and real, uh, and real magnons. And again, um, you can, it is reasonable uh, to think that um, if you create a bound uh, state, uh, this uh, forces two magnons to be close uh, to one another, and this will not really be liked by an antiferromagnetic uh, interaction. So you can convince yourself by this argument or by looking at the dispersion relation that naturally bound states will have higher energy uh, compared to unbound uh, state, and therefore you better look uh, for uh, the ground state in uh, the sector where you have R real uh, magnons and no um, magnons in any uh, bound state. Okay, so let's look uh, what um, states we have with this, uh, uh, with this constraint. So I use that formula that tells me how uh, I can choose my quantum numbers. So I have to choose R uh, quantum numbers to distribute within an interval between minus I max and uh, plus I max, where I max is given by this uh, formula. So let me calculate what is I zero max. So it's equal to N minus one over two plus the sum of over all the magnons. I only have uh, zero magnons, so minus j zero zero, and uh, I have the number of magnons, which is itself n. Actually, yeah. Let me put n here. Then I put. I choose. I look for j uh, zero zero. This is equal to. Uh, 2m plus 1, so this is equal to 1 half, and so this is, and I, what am I doing wrong? I I know the answer.
I'm not supposed to have this minus one. I don't know where I have a mistake, but it should look like this. This actually, this should have been n minus. Oh yeah, because I have to take. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I was looking for the wrong quantity because I was looking for p, which is equal to two i max, which is the number of states that I can have. So this is indeed like this. So this is n minus two n over two, which is n states. No, okay, keep going wrong. N minus two j zero times nu j zero is equal to one half. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, and half. Yeah, sorry, of course. Yeah, sorry. To have zero magnetization, I have that the number of spins is equal to half uh, the total number of uh, of sites. And so I have n half uh, uh, free uh, magnons, and to be placed in into an interval between uh, minus n over four and plus n over four. Sorry for the for the confusion. I got lost in a glass of water. So you have that you have exactly n half um, positions to put n half quantum numbers. So essentially, you have no uh, freedom, and this state is given just by a Fermi C going from n minus n over four to a plus n over four or field quantum numbers. Yeah, there is a, an additional factor of two coming from, from this one. So I have, so let me repeat the, what I was doing. So the, um, the range is from minus i max to i max. So which means that the total number of quantum numbers that I can have are equal to plus 2i max uh, plus 1. So here this range is 2 minus uh, n minus 2 j 0 0 mu 0. So I have this 2 j calculated at magnon equal to 0 is equal to 1 half. Mu 0 is equal to n over 2. Then you factor everything together, and that comes uh, to n over two. So I knew the the result, and I got uh, uh, ahead of myself in uh, using the factors. Then I can look for what happened with the excited states. So in the sector of zero magnetization and all real. Magnons, I don't have any uh, any freedom, so I can consider what happened if I remove one magnon uh, from the uh, from the ground from the real uh, distribution, and but one magnon is not enough uh, to uh, turn on any bound state, which means that I'm definitely going to end up in a sector with uh, magnetization 1 and r equal to n over 2 minus 1. And then I repeat the calculation of the available rapidity. So this is n minus 2, j0 remains the one from before, nu0 is equal to n over 2 minus 1. 
and you see that uh, this time you have uh, plus one. That the number of positions, um, the free range, the range of your quantum numbers is n half plus one, which means that by removing one uh, uh, magnon, I gain the freedom of choosing two holes in the distribution. So, which means that I this time I'm going from minus n over 4 minus 1 to n over 4 plus 1. This is the range where I can put my uh, quantum number. And my state is identified by uh, how I put my quantum numbers here, but it is more convenient instead of saying where I do put them to say the two places where I do not put them. So the two holes that are in this distribution. And this is, to me, a kind of magic, because you start from this, uh, from the ground state, you remove one magnon, and you get two degree of freedom to uh, specify in the state. So what are these two degrees of freedom? Um, somebody else also? You're right, but let's see if somebody else gets it. It's part of the quiz. I mean, so somebody has to answer. I announced it at the beginning that this was the, the goal of the lecture, so I already gave the answer. So, I have uh, delta S equal to one excitation with two degrees of freedom to specify the state. It's natural to guess that each of these degrees of freedom carries spin one half, and therefore that they are called spinons. So as I promised, spinon excitation emerge in a collective way. So here you have that your ground state is made out of all real magnon. You remove one, and you are left with the freedom for, uh, for this. So this, um, as I will argue tomorrow at this point, uh, the ground state can be seen as a, pseno, as a spin on vacuum in the same way as the ground state of the ferromagnetic chain can be seen as the magnum vacuum. And if I have time for the last little thing, let me look at another excited state. So now I remove another uh, real magnon. So here I have two options. I can not put this two uh, free magnon anywhere. So I'll be in a sector with magnetization equal to uh, two. So n one minus two, or I can put this into uh, a two bound state, uh, a two magnum bound state with all the additional magnum being zero, which means that R goes back to N over two and S Z goes back to, uh, to zero. So this case is similar uh, to, uh, to this one. As you can easily compute, you remove the second magnon and you free the other two places uh, to put your rapidities. So you excited another two uh, spinons. So this is a four spinon state. Well, let's look at, uh, at this. So. I, let me look at the number of uh, possibilities I have for the uh, quantum numbers of real magnum. So I have n, bless you. Uh, then I have this two. I have two types of magnum of uh, yeah of magnum types. So I have one half times uh, n over two minus two. 
and then I have the type 0 and 1, so I have plus minus 1 uh, times 1. So again, and minus 2, minus plus uh, 1, minus 1, so this is uh, minus uh, plus, no, it should be 0, actually. And uh, minus two plus two, so yeah, should be zero. And then for the other one, I have n two one half. Uh, no, this is not one half. This is one because it is uh, this factor uh, times n over two minus. 2 minus 2 times a half times 1. So this vanishes. Just to get minus 4 minus 1. No, this is what am I missing? Here I'm supposed to get one. So, and is that, does anybody see my mistake? Two, one, and minus one, minus two. Should be minus two because I should get this factor. Circa one. <laughs> Look for the mistake uh, later and I fix it. So, what has happened uh, here? No, but I'm doing something wrong. Okay, so I'll redo this calculation uh, tomorrow morning, but uh, what has happened is that here again, I'm, uh, I removed two magnon uh, from the ground state, uh, but I, um, I gain two uh, holes uh, to, uh, to play with with my um, real magnons, while uh, this uh, bound state has no freedom uh, whatsoever. So I have, again, a two uh, spin on solution. So what is the difference between this state and this state, which was also a two spin on solution? Hint, hint, here this was a delta s equal to 1, or to be more precise, delta s z equal to 1. Here instead, the total magnetization has remained 0, so this is a delta s z equal to 0. So? So. So here the two spinons were in a triplet uh, state, while here they are in a singlet uh, state. And uh, in particular here they are in the highest weight state of the triplet. Oh, here instead it's just uh, a singlet. So with this I stop and I resume tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabio. Very, very nice lecture. So we have time for some questions. And after the questions, we start with a quiz.
will you tell us what, um, um, if something special happens, if you choose some coupling constant to have special values, etc. For the XNZ uh, chain, no, I'm not going to go into, into that. Is the whole thing depend on boundary condition, periodic boundary condition? The, the Bethe equation depends on periodic boundary condition, uh, condition. If you change that, the whole formalism will... The Bethe equations do, the physics doesn't. So, and you can consider more generic uh, boundary conditions. Uh, this uh, changes the way that you quantize, uh, but that only at a formal level. But when you take the thermodynamic limit or when you take the system to be sufficiently large, uh, you don't see uh, effect as physically you should, uh, you should expect. But you can, uh, the beta equation becomes more complicated if you consider uh, open boundary uh, conditions. Uh, you do a funny thing that you consider the, the reflection, you double the system, but so it gets more complicated, but it can be, uh, it can be done straightforwardly. Okay, so there don't seem to be any further questions, so let's first thank uh, Fabio again.